All right. Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you all for worship today. It's not quite the location we had in mind, but this will work as well. It is good to be with you and a welcome to all of you joining us, whether on Zoom or on Facebook this morning. If you are a new worshiper uh, or you're watching this later on the replay and you're a new worshiper, thank you for joining us. We are pleased to have you and uh, we'd love to, to uh, make a connection with you. Just uh, look for the information either uh, at the end or in the, in the replay notes, there's contact information. Feel free to send me an email or to leave a message at the church and we would love to um, have a chance to talk with you or if you have any questions uh, about our ministries or about what we're all about, we would love to be able to make a connection with you. Um, uh, just a couple of notes about worship uh, this morning, of course, we are uh, indoors, obviously. Uh, we will use the format we had been using when we were doing Zoom services. Uh, some of you have that order of worship, so feel free to, to follow along with that. Um, I will have opportunities during the prayer time and the joy moments if you have elements you'd like to share. So please feel free to have those uh, ready if you would like to share at that, uh, at that point. Some of you may have seen uh, in earlier communications that we would have a baptism today, uh, and we plan that for outdoors. So we have rescheduled Hazel's baptism for uh, September 13th, uh, weather permitting, of course. So uh, put in a good word for some good weather uh, for that day. Uh, next week, we will have communion. Uh, whether we're indoors or outdoors, uh, communion will be part of the service uh, on next Sunday. So something to look forward to there. Following worship today, we will have a virtual coffee hour. So if you are watching on uh, Facebook, feel free to come on over to Zoom and join us. We usually, in the past, have maybe met 10 to 20 minutes. Just a chance to check in and see what all is happening in people's lives. So feel free to, to come and go as, as works out for your schedule. Let us now turn our attention uh, to God who is in our midst, even though we are gathered from many different places as we worship God together. If you would join with me, please, in our uh, call to worship, which you can see responsively on your screens. People of God, the Lord is merciful. God forgives our sin and pardons all our debts. People of God, the Lord is good. God restores us to the way of salvation. People of God, the Lord is love. God revives our spirit so that we may rejoice. People of God, the Lord is faithful. God speaks so that we may follow. People of God, the Lord is righteous. God's glory fills this place. Let us worship the Lord our God. Our opening hymn this morning is Grace Greater Than Our Sin. If you have a hymnal with you, it's hymn 365, and you can also follow along on the screen. Let us sing together.
Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, we confess that we have not always followed in your ways. We have not always followed your laws. We have not always been faithful to your call. It is not easy in this world to always continue to be, to continually be honest and courageous and true when other forces and other voices call us in different directions. But when we fall short, when we sin, still you love us, still you pursue us, still you encourage us to follow you once more. So we hear the word proclaimed today and in passages that are sometimes difficult to hear in this modern world, we ask that you hear for us the help us hear for us the truth uh, in the grace that is offered in these stories. So we ask this as we gather for worship in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We have two passages today. One, uh, one that you very well may never have heard before. It comes from the Apocrypha and our liturgist, uh, Debbie Prignitz will introduce and read that for us today. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is from Susanna, and in the New Standard Version, it is the 13th book of Daniel. Um, Susanna loved to walk in the gardens, and she was observed by two elders who lusted after her and began watching her day after day, waiting for a time when they could find her alone. Once when they were watching for an opportune day, she went in as before with only two maids and wished to bathe in the garden for it was a hot day. No one was there except the two elders who had hidden themselves and were watching her. She said to her maids, bring me olive oil and ointments and shut the door so I can bathe. They did as she told them. They shut the doors of the garden and went out by the side doors to bring what they had been commanded. They did not see the elders because they were hiding. When the maids had gone out, the elders got up and ran to her. They said, look, the garden doors are shut and no one can see us. We are burning with desire for you, so give your consent and lie with us. If you refuse, we will testify against you that a young man was with you, and this was why you sent your maids away. Susanna groaned and said, I am completely trapped, for if I do this, it will mean death for me. If I do not, I cannot escape your hands. I choose not to do it. I will fall into your hands rather than sin in the sight of the Lord. Then Susanna cried out with a loud voice and the two elders shouted against her. And one of them ran and opened the garden doors. When the people of the house heard the shouting in the garden, they rushed in at the side door to see what had happened to her. And when the elders told their story, the servants felt very much ashamed for nothing like this had ever been said about Susanna. The next day, when the people gathered at the house of her husband, Joaquin, the two elders came, full of their wicked plot to have Susanna put to death. Then the two elders stood up before the people and laid their hands on her head. Because they were elders of the people and judges, the assembly believed them and condemned her to death. Then Susanna cried out with a loud voice and said, O oh, eternal God, you know what is secret and are aware of all things before they come to be. You know that these men have given false ev evidence against me, and now I am to die, although I have done nothing of the wicked things that, that they have charged against me. The Lord heard her cry. Just as she was being led off to execution, God stirred up the Holy Spirit of a young lad named Daniel, and he shouted with a loud voice, I, know, I want no part in the shedding of this woman's blood. All the people turned to him and asked, what is it you are saying? 
Taking a stand among them, he said, Are you such fools, O Israelites, as to condemn a daughter of Israel without examination and without learning the facts? Return to court, for these men have given false evidence against her. So the people hurried back, and the rest of the elders said to him, Come and sit among us and inform us, for God has given you the standing of an elder. Daniel said to them, separate them far from each other, and I will examine them. When they were separated from each other, he summoned one of them and said, You old relic of wicked days, your sins have now come home, which you have committed in the past, pronouncing unjust judgments, condemning the innocent, and acquitting the guilty. Although the Lord said, you shall not put an innocent and righteous person to death. Now then, if you really saw this woman, tell me, under which tree did you see them being intimate with each other? He answered, under the masked tree. And Daniel said, very well, this lie has cost you your head, for the angel of God has received the sentence from God and will immediately cut you in two. Then putting him to one side, he ordered them to bring the other, and he said to him, You offspring of Canaan, and not of Judah, beauty has beguiled you, and lust has perverted your heart. This is how you have been treating the daughters of Israel, and they were intimate with you through fear. But a daughter of Judah will not tolerate your wickedness. Now then, tell me, under what tree did you catch them being intimate with each other? He answered, under an evergreen oak. And Daniel said to them, very well, this lie has also cost you your head. For the angel of God is waiting with his sword to split you in two as to destroy you both. Then the whole assembly raised a great shout and blessed God who saves those who hope in him. Thank you, Debbie. Our special t uh, special music today is from uh, Margaret, Margaret Sear, and the name of the, uh, the piece is called The Lost Chord, The Lost Chord, so enjoy.
And I, uh, Debbie also has our second lesson for this morning. This is from John 7, 52 to 8, 11. They replied, Surely you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. Then each of them went home, while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, all the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand up before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charges to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, and one by one, beginning with the elders, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go away, and from now on, do not sin again. That's the end of the reading. Thank you. So we continue this morning in the series of sermons throughout the year, looking at the themes, the main, well, at least the major themes of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. My um, thank you to all, a special thank you this week. We had planned, a, or at least I had planned a service uh, around uh, the baptism and shifted some, uh, some uh, services, some uh, scriptures and things around, uh, actually back to the way we had originally had uh, for today. So we're picking up uh, this piece of scripture from the from Susanna, or sometimes known as the 13th chapter of Daniel. Um, and it comes from the apocryphal books of the Deutero deuterocanonical books. Uh, some of your Bibles have those. If you have a Catholic background, you'll also know that these books are there as well as in Greek Orthodox uh, Bibles. But many Protestant Bibles do not have them. And so as a result, a lot of these stories are unknown. Uh, to many of us. And I would encourage you, if you've never looked at those, uh, and there's, there's quite a wide range. They're, they're texts that, although they did not make the canon uh, for Protestants, for the most part, they have authority in the ancient traditions uh, and, and indeed appear in the Septuagint, which uh, some of you may remember from disciple study, was perhaps the most influential uh, translation of the Old Testament out of Hebrew. Um, and of course, it goes back to the time, very close to the time of Jesus as well. And then this passage from John, which although many of you have heard it, uh, does not actually appear in the lectionary. So is one that you may not have um, heard much preaching on. I'm aware that these are passages that touch on life experiences that some of you have had. And some of those experiences are difficult to think about um, or to re-encounter. So I, I just want you to know that I uh, can certainly appreciate um, the, the difficulty in dealing with some of these topics. Nonetheless, uh, if anything, to me, it's all the more reason that the church needs to talk about these very difficult topics uh, to discuss and what they can mean for us. But I want to put them in the context, the larger context of, of, of uh, what do we do with sin? So the title of the message today is The Problem of Sin. First, though, would you please pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. A 
a man went down to a business to apply for a job. And like many places, there was a fairly extensive job application. One of the questions on the application was, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Uh, and he put no. And now the, there was a follow-up question, which was why. Now the why was really meant to be a response or a follow-up <laughs> who had been convicted of a crime. Uh, but he answered it anyway. And he wrote, because I never got caught. So perhaps for this guy, sin was, was uh, maybe something, or, or doing something wrong, was maybe something he didn't take particularly seriously. Unfortunately, throughout human history, given our human condition, we have not always taken sin particularly seriously. Either because so often in doing something that is not, uh, not right, doesn't do right by somebody, um, especially when the intent of the heart is malicious or the intent of the heart is, is not of, of God's. Uh, we've often rationalized as, well, if it's good for me or if it's good for my organization or if it's it just feels right or feels good to me, whatever the consequences uh, for somebody else might be. It gets particularly tricky uh, when power becomes involved. Power is at the center of this story with uh, Susanna. Uh, and this story most likely takes place during the exile. And you remember when we talked about the exile a couple of months ago, the Israelites were taken away to uh, Babylon in a time that is one of the most noteworthy times for all of the uh, uh, Jewish or Israelite experience. When they were found their temple destroyed the people were taken away and their very way of life, everything they knew was no more. They had to rebuild a life in a foreign land uh, while everything that they treasured had either been destroyed, carried away, or whose fate was unknown. You might remember that Jeremiah had encouraged the people nonetheless to make lives for themselves, to try to keep their community strong until the day when God would restore them. So it's in that context that Susanna happens. This is an unusual story for a couple of reasons. One of those reasons is that the hero, if you will, or the heroine of the story is, uh, is a woman. We don't have very many examples in scripture where the hero of the story uh, is a woman. We've had a few of those, of course, over the course of the year in Esther and Ruth. Uh, we see a lot of that around Advent time when, and Christmas when we think of Mary. But by and large, the movers and shakers of the stories of Scripture are so often men. Here we get a chance to see a story of courage from uh, the perspective of a woman. Um, it's also unusual, of course, it, it appears in the Apocrypha. So it's a story we don't uh, get to hear a lot of. Um, and it had some unusual characteristics as well, which is part of why it did not make the canon in some of our, our Bibles. Essentially, these two men who were elders, and indeed they were judges, people appointed to make decisions about the affairs of the people, had begun to lust after her. And they, at first, had done this independently of each other, and then discovered that they each were thinking similar thoughts and decided to collude together. They hid in her garden uh, and trapped her with an impossible situation. Either she consent uh, to be with them in a way that would have violated the, the law, in which case the sentence at the time was death, or she call out, and because of their position, it, they were pretty certain no one would believe her. It was two elders, two judges, two people with authority, respected authority in the life of the church against somebody who is an ordinary person. And not only that, but a woman who in that context was considered even less than an ordinary person in many ways. It was an impossible situation, and yet she decided that she was going to stay true to what she had been taught and true to her faith. So she called out. 
she called out for help so that there might be other witnesses. But the elders began to call out as well, and this really muddied the waters. The really central problem here is the power dynamic that exists. That is the difference in power between these two elders and Susanna. They're not on equal footing and they are not, are not on equal ground. Uh, and so often when we see this continuing today, if you think about those uh, names that surfaced uh, at the height of the Me Too movement, so often those that had taken advantage of women were people in positions of power. Some were journalists, some were politicians, some were business leaders, some had for at least had been respected in their communities. Uh, many had uh, positional authority over uh, other people as a boss, as a supervisor, as a decision maker. When you're in that kind of dis uh, uh, differential of power uh, and people take advantage of that, it's one of the uh, one of the ways we fall short of what God has in mind as the one who created us all with that spark of the Holy Spirit in us, all with equal dignity and equal value and worth, certainly in God's eyes. By her speaking up, Susanna was able to show courage, even when it looked pretty dire. We also get a sense of what God's justice is about. It would be easy, I think, to get hung up on the, the end result uh, of the two men. Um, some, and I know people have very varying views on uh, capital punishment, um, but it's not something we do much of today. Um, and certainly only for a narrow, when it does happen, it's for a narrow uh, list of crimes. So it'd be easy to get hung up on their punishment. It would be easy to get hung up perhaps on the very content of, uh, of this topic. But at the heart of this message, uh, I don't want it to obscure the heart of the message, which was that Susanna stayed faithful to God. And indeed, she called out to God and God heard her cry. This is actually something that we see at other points in scripture. You might remember when the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt and they called out to God and God heard their cry. You might remember other times when uh, women in, in several cases, for example, were not able to have children and they called out and God heard them and responded. So this is a, a pattern that you might recognize. There are consequences in this story for those elders and it was very clever how Daniel, this is the same Daniel that we'll actually hear from again a little bit later this fall, the same Daniel of Daniel in the lion's den fame, but at, a, at an early age. Um, and at least if you take it chronologically rather than the order it appears in scripture, this would probably be the first time he would have appeared uh, as a fairly young man. Long before there were video cameras and DNA evidence and fingerprinting technology came up with a very ingenious way to test the veracity of their story. And indeed, as they were independently interviewed, they did not have a consistent story, each identifying a different tree under which these accusations were made. So this story shows us three key pieces in dealing with, especially uh, sin in the context of unbalanced power. One is that when we focus on God and we remember God in our life, God will hear our plea. We may not always have a Daniel to respond, uh, but uh, as we've talked about earlier, that the, the worst thing in our life is never going to be the last thing. Second, that there are consequences of turning from God, that uh, there are uh, actions that we take that can lead to uh, these kinds of consequences. Now, it may happen in our life, and it may happen in the relationship we do or don't have with God in the life to come, uh, but these do happen. It's 
where we often struggle is that so often we don't always see where the, the sense of justice comes into play. And so often it, uh, it is our very selves as the people of God who make that justice real when we speak up, when we see something wrong, when we respond to the Holy Spirit stirring in us, just as it stirred in Daniel, when we respond to God moving our soul to take action, when we see an injustice or something wrong. But it also points out to the potential corruption within the religious community. We've certainly seen examples uh, in our own lifetime of whether clergy or leaders in churches or people of churches uh, turning uh, from not only from the principles of their church, uh, but taking part in criminal enterprises uh, in against society. And when, when that happens, of course, we should call it out, but we are so conditioned to the idea that faithful people or Christian people or religious people don't do that, sometimes we miss it. It's really, in this story, an indictment of the, the people, the other elders, and the other people that had gathered to hear the complaint of the two elders that accused Susanna, Susanna that they didn't even have a, a proper trial. They were going to just take their word for it and condemn her to death. As harsh as that may sound, we live in a world where so often we don't do our own homework when we hear something that sounds strange or hard to believe or might go against something we've learned. And I say go against not being, um, maybe against your principles, but just being different than what you've learned all of your life. So we have to uh, often do our own homework when we hear, uh, whether it's politicians in the selection season, uh, whether it is uh, trying to figure out what is the right information to follow in this uh, age of COVID uh, or whatever else it might be. Uh, it's important to do our homework. Uh, the story of the woman caught in adultery helps us see some other aspects. Um, if Susanna in particular helps us um, think about the problems with power dynamics, the woman in, in caught in adultery, the focus there is on uh, sin itself. In the story, people, uh, uh, a group of people brought this woman who, uh, we don't know the story, it's not told for us, it's just simply that she had been uh, caught uh, committing adultery. Now, unfortunately, the law at the time put the burden on the woman more than the man. So we know that some things in our own uh, culture and society and in the world have changed over time. They brought her to Jesus though, hoping that they could catch him because they knew uh, catch him uh, saying something that might uh, indict him against the rulers of his day. They knew that he had a higher opinion of women than the society at large and they thought they might be able to catch him saying something that they could use against him. I really like one of the pieces that William Barclay, uh, biblical scholar uh, that some of you may be familiar with, had said, which is this idea that Jesus' approach to the woman in uh, first asking those, whatever he was writing on the ground there, and then directing to the accusers the, the statement, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone, and then they all left. Uh, and I really like how William Barclay, as Jesus sends her away, says that he really is making a deferred sentence. In other words, this is a second chance for her. How many times do we find somebody who's, who's done something wrong or we observe them living um, in a situation that calls into question their actions or their morals uh, or their judgments. And we make a judgment. Jesus reminds us here that there is a second chance, even for those who make those kinds of decisions or live a life that might call into question their character or their judgment. It's also a reminder for us that that judgment 
really the ultimate judgment, that is who will make it into the kingdom and who will not, is God's alone to make. And we'll get a really good view of this in a couple of weeks when we talk about Matthew 20. But because none of us is without sin, the implied message is that none of us should be the ones casting those kinds of stones. We leave that to God, which is not to say we don't hold one another accountable, but our role should more be about how do we include people in the kingdom of God rather than how do we keep them away? How do we bring people into God's graces rather than how do we push them out? And how do we help people rebuild a life or maybe be redirected to a life that is uh, more positive, more hopeful, uh, and more productive? Sometimes that takes a lot of work and a lot of support to turn someone's life around. Some of you have had your own lives turned around in this kind of way, and you know from your experience. Because uh, sin is really, uh, at its heart, is about when we become more self-centered than God-centered. And I'd like to read uh, for you a quote in that direction from Jerry Bridges, um, where he says, our first problem is that our attitude towards sin is more self-centered than God-centered. We are more concerned about our own victory over sin than we are about the fact that our sins grieve the heart of God. Or in other words, we focus on the individual pursuit of overcoming our sin rather than seeing them as about a problem in our relationship with God. What are falling short or missing the mark uh, our sin does to God and what it does to one another. So often as those who brought the woman to Jesus do, the woman was not actually a human in their eyes, but rather an object, an object to use for their purposes, to be used for their agenda, to be used for their benefit. Jesus sees the person with pity, and often we, we have a negative view of that word pity, but you might just put it this way. He sees her as a real person with real feelings, with a real life and a real situation, and he addresses that. He doesn't use her for his own, uh, his own gain or his own purposes. He addresses her situation and what it was that she needs. These are really a core of what Jesus is about when he's dealing with sin. Yes, it's serious, and yes, it's to be paid attention to. And just as he uh, addressed the woman, to go and sin no more, we are called to do likewise. But the heart, it's about the person. It's about redemption and having the opportunity to make it right. Now, eventually, if we're not able to make it right, those, the continued gulf between us and God and one another will have those consequences. But God will take care of that. We are called to do everything we can in our power to be agents of that redemption. When we are in a power dynamic that puts us above somebody or we're beneath somebody about understanding those dynamics and seeking the kind of justice that God has, where in God's eyes, we are all on the same playing field. When we faithfully turn to God not only will our sins be forgiven, we will be given another opportunity to make it right, whatever our sin might be, and the opportunity to help put together the lives that have been torn apart by sin. In this time of great upheaval in our country and in our world, we would do well to remember stories like these and the opportunities they present to us to connect with people, and to seek greater wholeness in the living of our lives. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for uh, this day, but especially we thank you for being with us in the midst of our shortcomings, the places where we've turned from you and from each other, those times when we harm through our words and our actions. 
those times when we have thought more of ourselves than of other people. And we know in different ways we all struggle with some aspect of this. But with your help, we pray, we can better be your servants in this world. So it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, I don't, I have a potential joy moment today, but I wanted to see if anyone had a joy moment that they would like to share. Just want to thank uh, Melanie and Erica for another beautiful picture I received in the mail this week. And we did too. <laughs> And I did too. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Erica. One of the joys of, of this past week for me uh, in our uh, companions class, one of the, normally we'd have had this earlier, but uh, the pandemic forced us to do it uh, at the end. So we have an opportunity to share the gifts we see in one another. Um, and I found that to be a really whole, I, I've done this before, but I always find that to be a really holy experience. But the reason I share it as a joy today is it reminds me of how often our society is quick to criticize um, some of you, some of you may feel this way too, perhaps that we're quick to criticize others or to find the fault in others, and how often, or how rare it is, perhaps, to find the good in others. Uh, and that was what our whole session was about: seeing the strengths and the gifts and what other people have shared with us. So I encourage you to think about maybe one way this week you can, uh, to a friend or family member, tell them either what what they mean to you or how they are a positive force uh, in your life. Any other, any other joys today? All Dr. right. Tim, oh, yes. I, I also had the joy of receiving one of Erica's drawings this week and, and it matches the one she sent me at the Easter time which was a lovely lady in uh, blue and red. And now she has a gentleman and they're smiling at each other on my refrigerator right now. Yeah. Well, Erica, I, oh yes, go ahead, Ivan. Just un unmute yourself. Here, I'll unmute you actually. Think. Uh, let's see. I can't. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Ivan? I'm not able to do it for some reason. There you go. Yes. Uh, well, I just uh, everybody's saying this. Uh, I I got a card from uh, from her too this week, and to add on to it that. Uh, and uh, her mother and I share the same birthday tomorrow. Well, happy birthday to you both. Yes. And uh, Eric, I think you can, uh, I hope you've heard the, the wondrous um, difference you've made for so many people in how you share your, your drawings. And uh, thank you for the joy you've given so, so many of us. Right. So as we now turn to our prayer time, in just a moment, I'll give you an opportunity to um, share your prayer request. I had a couple come in from, um, or at least one come in from Facebook as well. 
if you would please keep the following persons in your prayers, please. Uh, prayers for Debbie and Lou Sharp, Darlene Nelder, Sheila Bellier, Dave and Marcia DeMerchant, Bob Sear, George and Joyce Knorr, Ralph Ferguson, Marilyn and Gary Langley, uh, for Joanne Smith, who, uh, who is at hospice and uh, has been grateful for your prayers, for Emily Robin and James Stewart, for Dave Corvo, for Megan Cousins, for Richard and Susan Clark, Phyllis Sykes, and the family of Jerry Dare who passed away last Sunday. This is uh, Jerry Dare is Chris Dare's father. Also, if you would keep Doris Jeffrey in your prayers, she did have surgery this week and it did go well. Um, but obviously we'll continue to need uh, recovery. Uh, also, if you would please keep in your prayers, Ron Albert, Ron Albert. That I believe is Scott's, Scott Albert's father, as I recall. So keep, please uh, keep him in your prayers. Are there other prayer requests as well? Yes, can we keep Marty Gallant in our prayers again continually? Sure. Uh, Neil, that was Marty Gallant? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I think everybody knows that he was a longtime guidance counselor at the high school. Anyone else? Uh, prayers requested for uh, the teachers and the staff of the, of the schools and colleges in our area uh, as they uh, either begin class or have begun class or will soon be in class, uh, both in challenging times for teaching and learning and trying to keep people safe. Any other requests? If not, let us be in a spirit of prayer. Holy and gracious God, we thank you that you hear all of these prayers, uh, including those that we have held in our hearts, but you hear no less. Surround these people with your care and your concern. Help them to know and to experience your grace that you pour upon each and every one, each and every day. Help us to be an answer to prayers in the way we live our lives. Help us be a means to uh, an experience of you through our prayers and our presence, even if it is different in these times, through the ways we give of ourselves and through our service to you. And when we fall short, help us to accept your grace and the grace of one another as we pick ourselves up, repair any damage, or get back on track in following your ways. We know this is not always easy, as it wasn't easy for the disciples, and yet you still nonetheless taught them to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So for announcements today, a couple that I have, um, weather permitting, we will return to the garden uh, next week. If you haven't had an opportunity to join us, we have uh, plenty of space. Um, we're also talking about some possible changes. I don't think we've settled precisely on any yet, but if, if a concern for you is parking and walking, if you could let me know or let the church office know, and um, uh, if we are able to work out something, we will, uh, we will work to be back in touch with you. Um, we know that for some it's been difficult to walk. I would just ask that those who, uh, for whom walking is not an issue, if you can either park in the lower lot of the church or even out on Sweden Street or some of your uh, other parking places uh, and leave the spots uh, 
opposite the Parsonage and up Prospect Street open for those who need to have parking close at hand. That would be a, a great help. Uh, Thursday night at 6.30, we will have our, uh, or an opportunity to gather to talk about some fundraising opportunities for the church. As you know, some of what we usually would do, uh, Harvest Supper, uh, Chicken Barbecue, among others, um, either haven't been possible or we would need to coordinate in a different way. And we're going to really look into what we might be able to do together. Um, the members of the church council already have received a Zoom invitation for that. And if you would like to be able to be part of that, just let me know or uh, a church council member know and we can make sure you have that. That'll be Thursday night at 6.30. Are there other announcements that should be made this morning? If not, then we'll turn to our offering. Uh, we are grateful for your continued gifts uh, to the church. Uh, you'll be hearing some more information in the coming weeks, but uh, due to the pandemic, among other factors, we are behind where we would expect to be. Um, and so would encourage you if you're able, sometimes that happens also at this time of year. So if you're able to uh, either catch up or make sure you're, your guests are able to continue to come in, that'll give us a good idea for our council to make uh, appropriate decisions as we come uh, into the fall. You'll see on your screen now some of the different ways you can give and any of those work and certainly let Tamara Wilcox or the, uh, the office know if you have questions about any of these. Let us receive our gifts uh, and give thanks to God. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, thank you for all the gifts you give us. Uh, we've in many cases been ever more aware of what is truly important in this time where travel is more limited and our comings and goings are what they used to be. Help us in the midst of all that, focus especially on you and the relationships of our faith, of our church family and our human family uh, and the people that live around us and with whom we live and work. Help us to have the forgiving kind of attitude you have that's able to direct people still to a better existence, a uh, better functioning in your ways. And when we fall short, give us the humility, we pray, to turn to your gifts once more, to use them for building up, uh, to use them for putting together this blessed community of faith to which you have called us. So it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning comes actually from the faith we sing today. Um, 2212, my life flows on an endless song. How can I keep from singing?
as you go to the rest of your day, um, as you think about where life is at the moment and how you can better walk in your faith with Christ and with one another, know that, you know, yes, we will make mistakes and sin is part of our human condition. When we faithfully follow God, not only God will God with us, be with us and give us those second chances in life, but will help us be part of the redemption story of others as well. So go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, go with the love of God, and go with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen.